Hello and welcome to Aspects of Writing. I'm your host, James Kelly. Today we're going to be talking about children's stories and the importance of charities. And our guests are uh, Walt Smith, Lori P- P- Petrowski, Petrowski. Petrowski. and it. Joyce K. Gatchenberger is our co-host. Uh, so before we introduce our first guest, like I said, we would like to talk a little bit about what we're going to be doing, and it's children's stories and how they relate to charities. And in a minute, I'm going to ask both Walt um, what charity he's associated with, and then we're also going to talk to Lori about what she has plans for. And Joyce and I are just going to improvise. I have an idea for what I want to do as well. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so first of all, Joyce, tell us who you are. You're our co-host today, but give everyone a little bit of your background. Certainly. Uh, well, I'm so happy to be here today. Uh, my name is Joyce K. Gatchenberger. I'm an author. I'm also a registered nurse. My first book, which is Lines of Listening, um, is a account of my family upbringing, and so that's why I publish under that name. That's the name I was born with. I also maintain a health and wellness blog, which is linesoflisteningblog.wordpress.com. Okay. And Lori, why don't you do introduce yourself and tell us about your what you write and, and your background. Hi, my name is Lori Petrowski, and I teach Spanish at the College of Southern Nevada and write in my spare time. I have two historical novels under my belt, Revolutionary Heart and Revolutionary Spirit, and I've just branched out into children's books, and I've got two that are just just on the cusp of, of being published. Uh, Wrigley celebrates Thanksgiving, and Caesar and Cleo find the perfect Christmas tree. All right. And Walt, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us about your background? Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Walt Smith, and uh, I live and work in Fiji. Uh, I've been in Fiji for the last 30 years, and um, the company that I have down there uh, is involved heavily in reef restoration work, and uh, therefore we also have a nonprofit organization that does a lot of charity work uh, for the villagers uh, down in the islands. I don't know if you know, but Fiji has 380 islands. Mm-hmm. So uh, the charity work that we do uh, is under the uh, heading of AID, which stands for ADE, Aquaculture Development for the Environment. Uh, back about 20 years ago, I, I developed uh, the first coral farm in the world, and this is what we use to uh, in our technology of doing the reef restoration work. And you do restoration of coral reefs all over the world? Uh, no, we set up the model in Fiji, and um, it's fair to say that most of the uh, areas in the world now that participate in this activity have uh, basically taken their inspiration from our original model. Okay. All right. And we, I want to talk about it because I'm a children's author as well. I wrote The Purple Caterpillar. And oftentimes when we're writing something, we I know you set out, when you set out to do your children's book, you always had the idea of, of, of attaching it to ADE. Is that correct? Um. Yes, I did. Um, because of the uh, what happens to the characters in the story, um, they get involved in, in some parts of you know what my life was about. So um, as a result of that, um, if the book sells well, uh, a portion of the sales goes to support the nonprofit organization. And Lori, um, we had talked a little bit before we went on air about right. you're trying to do something with yours as well. We, I think you mentioned the SPCA. Um, no, not the SPCA, but uh, related. It's called the Animal Foundation. It's here in Las Vegas. Uh, recently, I uh, adopted two white kittens, and that's Caesar and Cleo, and they are the inspiration for the Christmas book. And then Wrigley Celebrates uh, Thanksgiving is actually written specifically for a nonprofit. It's it's a fundraiser for the nonprofit. I donated my time, and um, all the proceeds go directly to the National Federation of Republican Women's Literacy uh, Project. And I would like to mention Adele Park, who also sent me three copies of her latest book for um, that she wants to donate to the SPCA. Let me just grab one real quick. I'll let you guys talk for a minute while I do that. Okay. Well, um, it's real interesting because when you write for charities and when you donate to charities, um, you really do it a philanthropic activity. Um, And so, Walt, could you tell us what motivated you to decide to kind of go on that course for your writing? Well, uh, yeah. A a long time ago, a movie came out called Nemo. (laughs) And uh, at Mm -hmm. the time Nemo came out, I had, uh, you know, small girls of my own. And it was a very popular movie. And as I watched it, I realized that it, uh, even though it was a great movie and very popular, it, it missed the chance to educate. And I said, there should be a format where children can go and be entertained, but also learn something. 
about the environment and what's going on. Uh, where I'm positioned in Fiji, I see a lot happening, you know, with coral bleaching and global warming and so forth. And I'm on the front lines, so to speak, of uh, what's actually happening to our oceanic environment. So I decided to uh, write this book, um, which I kept humorous and the characters are interesting, but underlying there's a theme of, uh, you know, creating environmental awareness. And this comes with uh, the characters noticing something's going on wrong with their reef. They don't know what it is. A couple of um, the main characters have been to the great learning um, that's called every several years. And the dolphins and the whales tell uh, the leaders in the ocean and all the villages within the ocean that the great learning is happening. So this is this is where the basis of the story evolves. Um, there are characters that know about uh, what's happening with the environment, and they help teach their village um, how to how to keep things safe. So the great learning is for the animals under the sea. Yes. But it's also <laughs> for humanity. It sounds like. Correct. It's a it's a, it's a version of our own uh, society, um, but it's sea creatures that have never seen the dry world. I've seen the dry world. <laughs> what I think is interesting too is because I just saw a documentary on turtles, sea turtles. And I think it was 100% of the sea turtles that they had taken in that were either wounded or in some way had problems. They found bits of plastic in their intestine that they could not digest. Some of it was just little tiny shards, and some of it was actually fairly large chunks of plastic mm -hmm. that they found inside. And I think that's what a lot of what you're trying to get across is what we're doing to the oceans today how we're actually polluting them in such a way we're destroying their ecosystem. That, that's correct. Um, interesting you mentioned turtles. Um, just recently, uh, Fiji banned in the grocery stores the sale or the use of plastic bags uh, because the people down there aren't as environmentally conscientious as we are, or we try to be, um, and they'll throw the plastic bags in the ocean. Now, this plastic bag, sea turtles will feed on jellyfish, and the sea turtles look mm -hmm. like jellyfish to the turtle. So there are so many uh, turtles that drown every year, thousands literally, uh, by snapping at a, at, a, at a plastic bag and it goes into their digestive system and their swim bladder gets all screwed up and, mm. and they die. Um, so there's a lot of things that we can bring to the attention of the public. And I thought a, a good way to do it was to start with the young. And um, I also realized that a lot of the young maybe won't be able to read the book themselves. So the grandmothers and the mothers that are reading the book also get a chance to learn. Mm -hmm. And part of the problem also that when it comes to where we are talking about sea turtles, for example, is that we have this preconceived idea from what we see on the media that when they have had, you know, lay their eggs, they lay hundreds of eggs and you see hundreds of these little turtles going into the ocean at one time. There's a very small percentage that actually survive. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so when you're thinking it in that respect, that small percentage, now they're up against not the elements, but human discard as far as waste. Mm -hmm. And now you're, you're actually eliminating how many of that small percentage survive. Right. Uh, usually at, uh, when they're going to die from human pollution, um, it's at a later age. But yes, it's a natural evolution of the sea turtle that only a certain percentage of them make them back to the sea. A lot of them are picked off with the, by the birds on the beach, and uh, since they're nice, young, and soft, <laughs> uh, they make very um, easy prey for the predators. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. Lori, why don't you tell us about your two books? Sure. Uh, Wrigley Celebrates um, Thanksgiving is, was the first one that I did. And um, as chair of the Literacy and Education Committee for the National Federation of Republican Women, we wanted to do an outreach to um, children that, that don't have access to books, children who frequent laundromats or maybe the food banks. And so our idea is we have Wrigley Raccoon Super Reader, and she's our, our super mascot, and we're developing a, a series of books. So the, the proceeds, as I mentioned, go directly to the National Federation. But we've created a program that all of the clubs can literally take and, and go in and set up a regular story hour. And the idea is that each child then will go home with his own book. Mm -hmm. And he'll have a, a you know lots lots of different ways to to encourage them book lists uh, achievement awards and things like that. But that was the first one, and I had so much fun. Then I had to go do <laughs> Caesar and Cleo find a perfect Christmas tree, mm -hmm. and 
the the reasoning behind that was it was I, I just watched them and they're, they're so much fun. Anybody who's a, adopted an animal uh, knows just how how much love they can give you. They're they're so grateful. Absolutely. And kittens, of course, are are adorable anyway. But we decided that uh, um, after the holidays, because of course it gets really really crazy, is that we want to do fundraisers for the um, the animal foundation, and that's where I got my my two my two uh, kittens. Yeah, and I want to mention again Adele Park. She wrote Splat When Cats and Polygamous <laughs> Collide. <laughs> what an interesting title. Uh, cats yeah, and, and polygamous. We want to thank her. She sent three copies to, to give to the SPCA for any fundraisers they may have in the future. So it's important to understand that, number one, when we're writing something, we just did a show on passions and purpose. And I think, quite frankly, both play into what we're all doing. Certainly. You know, there is certainly a passion and a purpose behind everything mm-hmm. we're doing. And I think for an author, no matter what you write, you might want to consider a charity because it's a way, a good way of attaching your project to something that people have an interest in mm-hmm. anyway. Uh, I really like the fact that one is for the helpless animals that are out there. And we all know what a lot of animals all over the world go through. I don't even want to talk about some videos I've seen. <laughs> and then when it comes to the environment and the sea creatures, you know, people don't even think about a lot of what's happening there and what's going on with our polluted oceans. I mean, people take barges of trash out to the middle of the ocean and dump it every day. And you have, I've seen these huge swarms miles wide of trash just floating out in the middle of an ocean somewhere. Mm -hmm. And what happens to that? I mean, you have to think about it. A lot of it doesn't decay because it, we created in such a way that it'll be there a hundred years from now or 200 years from now. Well, innocent sea creatures don't know that this is pollutants. And they do ingest it, not just the sea turtles, but a lot of of our creatures ingest it. And I think we need to be more aware of that. And I think that's what you're trying to do, Walt, is bring attention to that. Right. Well, not not so much the the, the floatsome that you're talking about. Um, Even birds um, uh, ingest that stuff um, because now they're finding islands full of dead birds that when they cut them open, they find nothing but plastic in their their intestines and so forth. But... um, my interest lies what's under the sea and um, knowing full well that very few people, a uh, very small percentage of our population actually get a chance to become aware of what's happening under the water. Um, not many people live near the water. Not many people that do live near, near the water get a chance to get in the water and have a look. Uh, I find this even true in Fiji. Um, we entertain uh, in our main company in Fiji, we have an export company there. Uh, that we supply public aquariums and, and uh, the pet industry around the world with, with the animals that you that you purchase or, or view when you go. And we bring in about 5,000 students a year come through our facility for an educational field trip. Less than 1% of them have actually seen what's under the water in their own country, even though they're surrounded by water. Wow. And uh, I've actually had a teacher ask me one time, uh, Mr. Smith, um, what do you use to paint the fish? Oh, ah. my goodness. <laughs> my goodness. <laughs> so, you know, that's the level. And, and it's things like that that make me realize that um, we really need to educate uh, people more about the ocean and what's happening there because it's an invisible world. It's outer space to most people. Yeah, it is a form of outer space. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. It's probably one of the most unexplored regions in the world, uh, the waters. There's, it's, you know, 70% of the earth is, I believe, covered in water. Is right. that correct? Close to it, I think. Yeah, 70, 75, yeah, yeah. around there. So it's the, the frontier that we haven't explored yet, or at least all of it. And, and Don't tell Sylvia Earle that. <laughs> <laughs> and Walt, I was looking at your book, and as I remember, it talks about the coral reef, specifically under the sea, and how beneficial it is to not only the ocean and the water, but us as humans above the water. Can you talk a little about that? There's a, yeah, there's, there's a lot to say about that, um, so I'll try to do it briefly. Um, coral is very important for a lot of reasons. Um, uh, one of the um, biggest benefits that I see um, today um, just coming up is the fact that coral uh, can actually uh, retain and sequester uh, CO2 gases and, and, and store it. Um, this is happening... Um, uh, just recently, scientists are realizing that uh, you know the rainforests will do the same thing, 
But when trees die and the leaves fall on the ground, they decay and the, and the CO2 goes back into the atmosphere. Coral acts differently. But the most important uh, function of the coral reefs is that they're the breeding grounds uh, for you know over 80% of what lives in the ocean. So when you have um, the small animals and the reef fish, um, you know the, the predators come in and feed on those. But the, it's really the, the start of life. And without the coral reef, uh, we actually have no uh, beginning of life cycle uh, in the ocean. So it's very important to keep that alive. Uh, a lot, not a lot of people know that coral itself is a, is a colony of small animals. Um, most people say, well, coral, that's a stone or it's right. a rock, yeah, it's a rock yeah. of some sort. Mm -hmm. And they don't realize that that colony of animals uh, is all... Um, they're independent animals, but they depend on one another, and they, and they live on a skeleton that continues to grow over and over. So when you go into a gift store and see a piece of dead coral, you're actually buying the skeleton uh, that is left behind by millions of animals. And that's one of the things I wanted to ask you is that what we see more and more in the news is how many of the coral reefs are going to the wayside, that they're dying off. What's causing that? Is it the pollutants as well? There's a couple couple factors that, that cause that, and the most common terminology used to describe that is called coral bleaching, and it's when the coral turns white. Um, and there's the reason that that happens is the coral itself has uh, an algae called zooanthellae algae that lives within the tissue. That algae is the garden or the food source for the coral itself. The zooanthellae algae is depending on the right temperature and the right sunlight. It de it's, it's photosynthetic, so it depends on you know, the sun to, to keep the algae alive, and then the algae keeps the coral alive. When the water becomes too warm, the algae dies. It doesn't really die, but it exits. It mm -hmm. leaves the coral and, the and, in hopes of finding a, a cooler area to live. Uh, the reality is that it, it dies. Um, the coral is still alive, even though it's snow white, uh, hence the term bleaching. But um, if that algae doesn't return within a few weeks, then the coral dies. And what happens next is uh, the dead coral rocks, the opportunistic algae that's in the area, the large algae, the hair, and the grassy algae move in and smother the coral so it never has a chance to recover. So what is your take on global warming? In what terms? Well, because it sounds like global warming does affect the coral reef. Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. There's no denying it. I, I've... Uh, our first, we had our first uh, coral bleaching event in the year 2000 in Fiji, and I had a lot of the sci uh, scientific friends that I know, uh, top coral researchers, call me and say, "Walt, uh, can I come down and 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 see this because it's happened, you know, in years past, you know, more recently, in, in you know, in the late 90s, um, in the Indian Ocean and started moving towards the Barrier Reef in Indonesia, and then Fiji had its its first event in 2000, but no science has uh, or scientist has been able to uh, get to the fire while it was burning. So we invited uh, one of the most uh, famous scientists in the world, Dr. Bruce Carlson from Hawaii. He came down and stayed several weeks and did a lot of studies and then returned every year to watch that same coral reef that he watched die before his eyes and what happened and how long it took to recover. And a lot of information has come out of this, but there's no denying how serious uh, global warming is and its effect on the on the on the barrier reef. Um, there's uh, in in the year 2000, 80 percent of the coral on the east side of our island uh, perished wow. in, in one year. Wow! Oh my! 80 percent. Is that something that can be reseeded? Um, it 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 does resettle. Uh, the surviving corals um, that are still there um, will you know spawn every year. Uh, the spawning season is October to November, on the second full moon. Um, and they um, have a large spawning event. But if there's not a lot of corals there, a lot of the, not a lot of corals spawn. After three years, each one of those settlements become mature enough to spawn on their own again. So within 10 years, the reef, believe it or not, was back to almost its original state, uh, but it was barren for about three years. Mm -hmm. So basically what you're saying is these are organisms that move, the corals, or do they not move? How, how is it that they go through the spawning process? Um, they give off what they call gametes, which are like um, little sperm cells that float in the water, uh -huh. and uh, they'll live up in the up in the sunlight, in the top ten centimeters of the water, for a, a period of time, depending on the species of coral that's um, that's spawning, um, and they all spawn at the same time. And once they build up a little weight uh, from absorbing the photosynthetic 
you know, um, um, Element, process, yeah. uh, they start to sink. And as they sink, uh, they're opportunistic. They, they look for an area that is going to be okay for them to settle on. Uh, once they settle, they're pretty much stationary. Uh, that's where they're going to be the rest of their life. Okay. Mm. And they feed on the algae is what is basically their food source. The, the, the algae that will move in as the coral grows mm -hmm. and live with it its whole life. It's a symbiotic relationship between the algae and the coral. Okay. And I, that's really important, I think, because if, if children are going to be reading your book, you know, you, you do use the coral reef as, a, as an example of where your creatures live and surround. Mm -hmm. you, it gives them a little idea of what you're talking about, or at least for the parents to try and explain. <laughs> well, the, op the opening of the book is about um, the leader of the group announcing to the village that, look, something's going on here. We, uh, we don't know what it is, but, um, you know, look at some of these corals. They've turned white overnight. Um, we really need to go find a better place to live um, for the future of our of our village, and so that's how the journey ensues. That's how that's the basis of the story. These this group of people traveling the ocean to find a better place to live. Okay. And Walt, it sounds like in your book it, the indication of the coral reef and the health of that is also uh, giving the people in the island the indication for their health because without a healthy coral reef, there's no healthy uh, life for the people that live on the island itself. And tourism. And tourism. And tourism. And it's interactive and feeds back on each other. As you said, symbiotic. Right. It, it, it's all kind of a symbiotic relationship. And tourism, of course, um, is about 80% 80, 80 of the Fijian economy. Mm -hmm. um, and without coral reefs, uh, that tourism would drop dramatically. Um, people that sit on the beach, but also most of the people that come there want to get in the water and you know, have a good dive. And we are um, noted for having some of the most luxuriant coral reefs in the world. So it's a very high, highly sought after dive area and tourism continues to grow. Um, if the coral reefs start to die, everything's going to reverse. Mm -hmm. well, is the Fiji government aware of this? Aware of? The fact that, the, you know, there's a problem with coral reefs and then they need to get in and protect the coral reefs. How, how much protection are they offering for these reefs? Um, actually quite a bit. And, uh, what, uh, they're doing is they're setting up, um, you know, MPAs, which stand for marine protected areas. Um, the, the, the fishing rights in Fiji is, um, allocated in a way that every village chief, um, is, in, is responsible for a certain area in the ocean that's, you know, associated with their, their village. It's like land rights. They have a, bo a you know, a boundary that is, what they call their goalie goalie. Now their goalie goalie, they manage, and uh, nobody else can fish in that area. And a lot of the uh, chiefs and villages have voluntarily given up half of their goalie goalie to uh, an MPA. So that means uh, another Fijian word is tambu, which means you cannot fish there. It's a it's a, a no fish no take zone, mm. um, and that's growing more and more. Uh, we have a lot of. Um, you know, we have a, a, an office um, that's uh, managed by the World Wildlife Foundation in Fiji. We also have uh, the locally uh, managed marine protected areas, um, which is a large organization throughout the Pacific. Um, and we have a main office in Fiji. We also have the uh, IUCN, which is the Interna International Union uh, for Conservation. They're um, also in Fiji. So there's a lot of people looking at it. And... Um, the problem with the government, it changes a lot. Um, education is not, uh, in these areas, is not necessarily a priority. If you become minister of the fisheries, you may have been minister for forestry last year. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a, there's a bit lacking in terms of the specific education needed. But uh, I think Fiji is getting it. We hope. We hope. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Lori, did you have anything you wanted to add to this? To, to well, because I know when you, you when you wrote your books, because um, uh, we are talking about purpose and passion also right. as well, you know, with what you're mm -hmm. trying to do, you have to have that in order to create these children's stories. I know I did. Sure. And um, obviously you have a passion for cats. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the cat lady. I told my parents I couldn't possibly buy, ever buy a house by myself in a small town because I would be ostracized. <laughs> at, the, at the time I had two black cats, so that made it even worse. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, the, the the thing is, yeah, you know, I've been teaching now since 2003, so it's quite a while. But I hadn't realized just 
what a problem literacy is for for our our children. I I I teach at the college level, and I have students who come in who literally will walk out of a, a class. I teach Spanish, but they will walk out of a class to avoid reading in English because they cannot read in English. Oh, they wow. they can't put a sentence together in English, and I'm I'm at the college level, and so that means that. Uh, things are, are, are getting missed way, way early. And so with the uh, Wrigley books, what we wanted to do was to reach out to children who, I mean, maybe they have a cell phone at home <laughs> uh, but or video games, but do they have a book? Yeah, we you just know? spoke to someone about that who mm-hmm. teaches creative writing, and that was one of the problems she said that, that you know, is a challenge is to get students to stop with the texting, because right. we were talking about how they use abbreviations to write now, yes. and they don't use whole sentences, and that impedes their writing process. Oh, definitely. So, you know, we were just talking uh, mm-hmm. with someone about how important mm-hmm. it is to get the, the children out there into reading books, and yes. when they're writing, to form full sentences. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, don't use abbreviations, you know. Yeah. Now, the idea behind the Wrigley books, we, we have the mascot, the super reader mascot, and we want children to realize that, you know, if they come to the story hour, somebody will sit down with them and will read with them. And then they go home and that book is theirs to keep. Okay. And then ideally the the clubs go on and, and like libraries have a, a a story hour. But those books stay at the library. This this is a book that they can go home. They can read it on their own. They can read it to their younger brothers and sisters. And every time they come, they can get a book. They can get a different book. So they can start creating their own library and something that, that, you know, as they move from place to place, they can go with them as well and get the sense that many of us do is that books are to be treasured. And that's part of what I'm going to be asking in a minute. Lori, I want to ask you first, where mm-hmm. can we find information out about your books? And right now I know the children's stories aren't ready yet, but you have a website? Um, yes. Um, I, I'm at uh, Lori petrowski.com l-o-r-i-p-i-o-t-r-o-w-s-k-i.com and we'll have both books there uh, as well as uh, they'll be available on goodreads and amazon and uh, well by the time this airs they'll they'll be available but yeah okay and uh, and walt where can we learn about where your books are or your book is and what what's going to be happening next with the next book um well we do have a website and that's uh, boulevardies.club uh, you can also uh, access the same uh, website with com if you can't remember the word club. Um, <laughs> but uh, we, And we decided on club in the first place because it's kind of cute. The kids, yeah. we do have a club uh, on the on the site. So anyway, and um, it, it, Bula Buddies, like, like I said, is the name of the book. It's also available on Amazon, and um, it's available on, on the website itself. And book two is in production right now. I might mention that it, uh, the first uh, book is a series of th- uh, one of three, um, and that's building the whole story uh, before they take their journey. Okay. And what about your project? Is there a website for that? Um, yes, the, the aid project. Yes. Um, it, it's, uh, uh, it, it's aidproject.org. A-D-E. A-D-E project.org, okay. O-R-G. And you'll learn a lot there about what's happening with reef restoration, um, how we involve the villages, um, what the aid project actually does for the environment, and how well it's received. Um, we're being supported by a lot of outside donors. Aid is completely funded um, by outside donors. And uh, my main company up until last year was uh, was the main funder uh, for the aid project. But uh, um that that no longer happens because the main company is now shutting down. So um, we have some gracious um, we have we have some gracious donors that are really supporting uh, this well. Do you have something you wanted to add to that? Oh, and it's also av- it's also <laughs> available on Facebook and Instagram. Oh, there you go. <laughs> that showed you how tech I, I am. I think Deb <laughs> kind of slipped that in there to you, his wife. <laughs> You don't see her on camera, but she is here. <laughs> I'm just not a techie kind of guy. You know, I've, I think I've got too much water in my ears. 
we need one of these signs over here so when we need to ask something and someone's forgot, we can just type it in. And <laughs> there you go. That's how we usually work. There you go. Uh, well, you know, I, I want to talk a little bit about the experience of writing a children's book. Why, why did you decide to do this as a children's book instead of just writing about the environment itself? Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I have um, two children of my own, and I also have um, a lot of grandchildren. So... Um, I wanted to do something to appeal to them, to leave behind for them. And um, I also note that um, when all these students have come through our uh, facility year after year, um, it's there that the learning really starts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, I, and, and I'm, I, I like to write humor. I, I like to write nice, funny things. Mm -hmm. And I love animation. I love um, illustration. Um, my background is uh, I'm an architect by trade, so I'm really interested in all of the graphic art that goes into a book. Sure. So because of that, I thought a children's book was most appropriate. Well, I think it's important to point out, too, how you actually ended up publishing this book, because I know you had it sitting on the shelf for a while, and I believe it was your daughter that brought it back to your attention when she got older. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, I actually uh, woke up one morning in 2004 with cold sweat on my forehead and turned over to my wife and said, I got to write a story about little blue people that live under the, <laughs> the sea. The Smurfs. <laughs> <laughs> another Smurfs book. <laughs> and she said, oh, no, not another idea. But I started writing immediately. I had a, I had a mission in mind. Um, and that went on for uh, about two years and, until about 2006. And the characters, you know, kept morphing. I kept trying to find different artists, couldn't find an artist that would stick with it. Um, they would do it for a little while and said, no, I want to go back to my regular job and you know, stuff like that. So it was very difficult to get anything to stick. And so it just sat on the shelf, even though I had written the, the first, I'd actually written, I've, I've written six books so far. Um, only one is uh, published. And um, then my daughter uh, came along about two years ago. Now she's got her own family, three little girls. And they live in Maui, uh, Hawaii, and they were visiting us in Fiji. And she saw the book sitting on my desk, and she says, Dad, whatever happened to that? You know, why didn't you finish that? You promised it would be, you'd have it done in time for, for my little girls. And I said, you're right. And I think the, the magic that happened uh, with that comment from her and the time that had lapsed, um, it became a much better project. Oh, good. I was able to find better artists, better illustration. I have a great art director who I've worked with for 40 years on all my uh, other projects. And, and you I, do and documentaries as well. just so And that, documentaries yeah. and so forth. Did, did a lot of that. And um, it, ju it just it came to better right. So, you know, the right time, the right place. All right. And I, I want to point out, I wanted to talk about the illustrators for a few minutes because I know, Lori, we were talking about it. Yeah. One of the struggles a lot of, of, of our, uh, writers have who write children's stories is mm -hmm. finding the right illustrator. And it can get very frustrating. And as a matter of fact, sometimes someone will start a project and then they'll stop for whatever reason. Then you're back to square one trying to find another illustrator. Mm -hmm. And you actually found one online, Lori. Is that correct? I did. Uh, somebody had told me about a website called Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R. -R. And so I went up and you just tell them what you're looking for. And then you just scroll through and s they've got samples up there. See what you like, whatever. And... It's called Fiverr because the initial price is five dollars. So you may Fiverr. Pay, yeah, Fiverr. Yeah, Fiverr. <laughs> I, like I like it. You might. I like that. That's an easy thing to remember. <laughs> it is. It is. Money, money. <laughs> and you, you you might pay a little bit more. I mean, somebody might say, okay, well, my opening bid's fifteen or or ten right, or yeah. something like that. But it's you know, it it was you know I, for both of mine, I I. I've got two books out with probably 48 illustrations, and I paid less than $250. And well, and the other thing is you can find editors, I believe, on that site as you well. You can find editors, you can find writers, you can find photographers. Uh, almost anything that you want to do, you could probably find up there. And they actually give you their background. They actually give you sample materials. You can yes. actually contact those people. And you can get revisions as yeah. well. I mean, you get you know X number of revisions, and then after that, they charge you, I think it's like $5. <laughs> yeah. But, but um, yeah, like like the, the gal that I found, she's from Morocco. I, I was so pleased with what she did with uh, the Wrigley book that I said, oh, good, because I have this other project in mind. And turns out she's a cat lady, too. So ah. <laughs> it worked out great. 
Another part of this process that I want to talk about is what both, I know you have been through it, I have been through it. When it comes to getting this published, it's not as easy as one might think it is either. <laughs> um, so true. I know, Walt, you were telling us before we went on air the difficulty with going to the different outlets that you can put it on, and they want different formats. Um, so, you know, I know when I created mine, I'm, I'm like you. Originally, my verbiage was in the care, you know, in, in this illustrations. And then when I wanted to put it out on a certain platform, I had to separate the verbiage from the pictures in order for it to format properly and get it into the system. You could have left it in into the illustrations, but the problem is, is if they reduce that down, then it's very difficult to read. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of times when we're writing something, it's we don't know this. You know, if someone's not telling you this, we have no idea what we're up against when we go to put a book out. And that's why I want to share that, because it is important for up-and-coming writers to understand that mm -hmm. these are the challenges if you have an illustrated book that you're going to face. Mm -hmm. uh, and that isn't necessarily just with a children's book, because there are pictorials or picture books out there that people do as well. So you have to keep all this in mind when, you, when you're out there trying to produce a book. Mm -hmm. We can write a book, we can get it all together, we can mm -hmm. hire an illustrator, but there's so much more to it than that. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I, I found out this time around is I, I hadn't realized the variety of sizes. That, right. And I had thought that we would do an eight and a half, well, actually, excuse me, 11 by eight and a half, so it would be a, a landscape. Well, Amazon doesn't offer that. You can mm -hmm. get an eight and a half by 11, so vertical, but you can't get a landscape. Mm -hmm. So literally for uh, the Wrigley book uh, got delayed because we we had gone 11 by 8 and a half and now we had to resize it. So we resized it to 8 and a half by 8 and a half. So it's a square book now. But that was something that, I mean, you need to go through and see what trim sizes are available before you contact the illustrator. Right. And you know what? Well, yours is um, a landscape. Yes. So that might be an issue when it comes to also getting it up on some of the platforms. Um, I know you said they've actually asked you to reduce it. You can't reduce it because the illustration has the verbiage in it as well. So there's a little challenge there for you. Yes. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And what I was told by the, the company that we went to to, to, you know, to turn it into an e-book, um, well, they were talking language I didn't understand, so I put my artist and, and my art director and him together. And, and what I come to learn was that um, the whole series um, of each page is done in a series of plates. And they had to lift the plate that had the, um, you know, the, the verbiage or the, the graphics on it uh, to, a, to a separate element so that they could move it off uh, the page itself and put it on a banner. Well, I didn't design the book that way, right. um, and and a lot of effort went into creating the space on the illustration because it's a, for those of the, that can't see on the radio, it's a fully illustrated book, um, edge to edge. Um, there are spaces created in the illustration uh, that fit, you know, the uh, the graphic itself, uh, and to remove the graphics and put them in a banner just kind of goes against the way the book was designed to right. begin with. So mm -hmm. that's something I didn't know. Also, we like the nice whim whimsical kind of font. The, the book itself is, is a ra rather large format. It's, it's 10 inches tall and 12 inches wide, uh, landscape as well. And um, so the font that we picked looks beautiful in the format that it's in because it's nice and large. But when you shrink that down to where somebody can read it on the phone, you won't be able to see the letters. And I, I, here's part of the problem with what, what I see with all of us, what we're doing. One is when you're self-publishing, which we're all self-published, mm -hmm. these are the difficulties we are going to face. The other thing would be if you went out there and you found a traditional publisher, that for some reason, because I see books all the time that have the illustration and, 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 and the written into mm -hmm. the picture. So I know it can be done. Yes. They obviously have either the tools themselves, their own printing presses, or they know how to lay it out in a way that they, you know, with the people they work with to have that done. The problem is, is that you, when you try to find a traditional publisher, should you be lucky enough to land a traditional publisher, you're on a, a time frame now. Now, once they accept your book, you're back on hold for another year and a half to two years mm -hmm. before that book's produced and put out again. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, then you also lose creative control because once you've signed with a traditional publisher, 
what you think is a great idea, they might not think is a great idea. And they may say, I want to alter it this way, or I want to alter it that way. So in trying to stick with what we want, it's not an easy process. I will say what I love that you did, and it's a little brave, and it's a little difficult for some authors, is that you took this book and you published it yourself, and you actually, you did, you were very gutsy. You printed a large quantity. Mm -hmm. And when I say a large quantity, I mean a large quantity. But your book's selling, and that's what's important. Mm -hmm. And when that's without being on any of these outlets that you're talking about. Yeah. You know, basically it's through your website and personal appearances. Mm -hmm. So that in itself is amazing. You actually, you've actually reached a point to where most authors will never see in sales. Because the average self-published author is lucky to sell anywhere from 100 to 1,000 books period, in the life of that book. So, and you're, how long has your book been out now? A couple of months. And you've already sold a 1,000? Yes. That's pretty good. That's, that's very good. Very good. Yes. And well, I, I can explain a little bit of that and why why that's happened. Um, in my field itself, in, in the uh, aquarium aquatics trade, um, I happen to have a certain amount of fame. And um, I chose uh, the opening of the book to be at a large conference um, where all of the aquarist uh, in the country, in the world, actually gather. It, it's attended by over 6,000 people. Mm -hmm. And we um, we had a stall there, and we had my book there, and I was going to sign it for anybody that wanted to buy it. And in those two days on, on, the, on the weekend, we sold 300 copies. Um, mm -hmm. That's because people know me, they know who I am, and this is my, this is my contribution uh, into the literacy world. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, from the aquarium trade. Um, and the other copies have been selling uh, pretty well, um, you know, by word of mouth um, through through the aquarium trade. But uh, Amazon hasn't done so well for me, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you that. But I'm going to tell you what, what's key uh, as far as what you just said is I had Ned Barnett on and Joy Lynn M. Uh, Ross, mm -hmm. and they both are publishers, and, and then also Ned is a PR person. And he said one of the things that he tries to tell his authors to do, especially in Las Vegas, it's fairly easy to do, is to align yourself with conferences. Because a lot of these conferences that are come here are looking for people to come in and do lectures or talks about what they do. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be someone from the aquatic arena necessarily. You know, it, it you may want to talk about what you do. You could be about the environment. I mean, there's a lot of things you could do with what your your, your book's about. Mm -hmm. So he said if you can find those conferences, there's two ways you can work it. You can work it out to where the deal is, is that you can sell your book there after the conference is over. Or you can work it out there to where every person attending the conference gets a copy of your book. Either way, it's a win-win. Mm -hmm. So that's something I'm going to be looking to in the future, and I appreciate Ned sharing that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, <laughs> and you can do that yourself. You don't have to have a PR person or an agent or a manager to do that. You can actually call the convention center, find out what conferences are coming up, and you can just write to these major conferences and find out, you know, what the possibility is. Um, Amazon's a company that's here. Just out of curiosity, that would be an interesting thing to try and do is <laughs> approach them. They have one of the largest conventions now in Las Vegas. They're here every year. And you know, James, something I really like that both of these authors have done is they have appealed to children in mm -hmm. their books. And like they were saying earlier, children is or children are the place where the learning occurs. Mm -hmm. They um, will sit down. They'll be of interest. They will want to know what's happening next. They will like the bright colors. They'll like the interesting stories. Um, the fact that the story progresses to an end, you know, there's a beginning, mm -hmm. a middle, and an end. Children like um, not a lot of words necessarily, but they like the idea of the story. So what's happening to the character? What's going on next? Does he live? Does he die? Does his mommy come back? You know, does mm -hmm. Jimmy Joe come and find, mm -hmm. you know, the little <laughs> cat or whatever? Yeah. That's where the learning occurs because you're giving them the moral of the story, and that's what these two authors have done. And the other thing that the picture books do with the younger kids is it actually encourages them to read. I yes. just did the Las Vegas um, Arts or Book Festival mm -hmm. in downtown Las Vegas, and I had my book there for the kids to open up and read. And, you know, countless 
parents came by with their children, and some of them could not read at that level. Well, what they would do is they would turn the page, sure. and then they would look at the picture, and then the, they would start reading, and if they didn't understand a word, the mom or the dad would tell them what that word is. Uh-huh. And do you understand what that word is? And then they'd say yes or no, and then they'd explain. And they would sit there and read the entire book, which was a detriment to me because they'd read it and now they didn't want to buy it. Mm. But <laughs> <laughs> but they read it. <laughs> but they would read the whole book. And you know, that was I thought that was fascinating that the kids, even if they weren't at that reading level, yes. that they would still, because the pictures caught their attention, they would want to know what it says. Right. What is mm-hmm. that? Mm-hmm. And my office manager has a three year old grandson and he's that way. He would sit there exactly what I just said. He would sit up front and he would sit there and turn the page and try and read it. And obviously he's three, mm-hmm. but he's already reading. Mm-hmm. And um she would explain to him what it is or she'd finish reading it mm-hmm. to him. Mm-hmm. So it isn't, it's like you said, your book is also a book that, that, you know, a parent or a brother or a sister or a grandparent can read to their children. And the pictures is what's going to keep their attention. And, you know, what, what are they doing now? Why are they doing that? Mm-hmm. So it's good. And it's important to keep that in mind when writing a children's book. Um, our, our book has actually gone to a couple of schools and teach, teachers use it, you know, for group reading. Right. Um, and I've got pictures of the teacher that they send back. Uh, my class really loves your book. They want me to read it every day, so forth. And there's pictures of like 30 kids sitting on the floor at the foot of the teacher oh, how while fun. she's turning the page. <laughs> I love that. And it's the inspiration to the young that really gets me because the, 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 sto- the story also has a message. So not only are they being entertained, mm-hmm. somewhere down deep they're learning something as well. Yeah. And they, they, may, they may not realize that. We have... You know, in the in the school trips that we had at our facility over the years, uh, we've had a lot of people. Like I said, we do about five thousand students a year, and just recently, over the last couple of years, I've had people come um, that went to the university and got a, a degree in marine biology, and asked for a job. And we love to hire people that have that level of education, especially mm-hmm. in Fiji. And after they were working for me, this happened in two cases. After they were working me, w- w- uh, you know, for me for a while. Uh, they, uh, one of them came up to me and said, you know why I wanted to work here? When I was younger, I came here at, on a field trip in my school. And, and I decided that day that I wanted to do this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I wanted to learn more about this. So I went to school and got a degree in marine biology wow. so I can come and ask you for a job. <laughs> that is so <laughs> cool. Oh, yeah. well, well, Walt, I can verify that with you because I, I and my family have spent many years living in Hawaii. And I'm looking at the front of both of your books, and they're very full of color. Mm-hmm. And I can remember diving both in the North Shore and, and in other parts of Hawaii, and my children would see the bright colors of the fish. Uh-huh. And they are grown adults at this point, and they still remember going down in the waters off Hawaii and saying, look at the orange, look at the green, look at the yellow and the purple. To this day, they remember that. So yeah. you're right about making an impression on children at a younger age. That's true. You're right. One, two things I wanted to bring up too. What we can do with our books when it comes to children's books. You, you recently met Jennifer Hart, and yes. I was going to try and get her on the show with you, but she had other obligations. And Lori, mm-hmm. I know, I think you know Jennifer. I'm not sure. Yes, if you I do. Okay. One of the things that she's done with her book, which is interesting, is she's done what's called an activities book that goes along with her her children's book. It's a separate book that's mm-hmm. both an activities book and a coloring book. And another person we've had on is Two Bears Medina who wrote Mm -hmm. Itchy the Goat. And what he did, he did a book that is like um, a question and answer, separate book. Mm -hmm. It's like a teaching book. So that you want to see how well they paid attention to what they were reading. You know, like, who was Itchy? What kind of animal was Itchy? So you have this whole thing. Teachers loved it. That actually sold out for him to where teachers wanted it because now when they would read the book to them, they could go back and do like a quiz on it. Like, uh. okay, what was this book about? You know, what did you learn from this book? You know, wh- how many of these animals were there or this? So there are a lot of ways you can attach something to what you're doing mm-hmm. that can actually add to it. Yes, well, go ahead. Um, interesting you should say that because – we have an activity book that's being produced right oh, now. Oh, wow. okay. And <laughs> we, we also have a puzzle. Um, okay. And the puzzle is being delivered next week uh, from the manufacturer, and um, it's a 206-piece puzzle. Wow. Um, I have a lot of, you know, I, I got a lot of samples before it was produced, and it took me and my wife a day and a half to put this puzzle together when it, when it, when it came to us. It's all based on the characters of the book. Okay. And um, when I gave it to my granddaughter, 
It took her about 45 minutes to put the uh-huh. puzzle together. Wow. Uh-huh. And, and, and you said it took you two days? Yeah. <laughs> you might have that spatial recognition <laughs> aptitude. But, but, but if you, also, if you go on our website, um, there is there is a, uh, a tab called Glossary. And the, if you open that up, um, and the website, again, is based on the book. If you open that up, it, it talks about all the things in the book that you might not understand, like why do the corals turn white? Oh. I didn't okay. want to put that in the story because I didn't want to freak little kids out. Uh-huh. Oh. Uh, there's a, there's another part in there about dynamite fishing, which is what the shadow, the oh. name of the first oh. book is, um, yeah. you know, the mysterious shadow, and that's the boat that's up there throwing explosives. Oh. Um, I didn't want to freak the kids out with a bunch of right, dead fish. Right, 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 but right. you can learn about it on the glossary if you want to go that far. Okay. All right. And so you already have, you said, an activity book going activity along with Activity book this, and, a, and a puzzle. And a puzzle. Right. Yeah. So and, there's and several things right there yeah. we can all take. Go you know, and, and go home and think about and you know, redesign and come up with. Uh, Lori, did you have anything you'd like to add about what you've written? Um, no, I think, uh, you know, wh- the, the main thing with the, the Wrigley books is that we're using it to impart uh, U.S. history. So many uh, students don't get a lot of history. And so the idea behind the, the Wrigley Celebrates Thanksgiving is we talk a bit about the history of Thanksgiving. And I didn't even realize that it's actually Abraham Lincoln who set aside the fourth Thursday every year. Several presidents would hold one, you know, a day of Thanksgiving, you know, every once in a while. But it wasn't until um, Abraham Lincoln said, we will, do the f- we will set aside the fourth Thursday in November. And it was to remember and to bring together people who had, um, you know, the, all the families that had been destroyed during the Civil War. So it was to be a, a period of healing. And I think that's important to, for us to remember. I mean, we, we think of, you know, just turkey and, you know, football and mm. rose parades and, and things pilgrims. like that. And, and, pil- and pilgrims. And pilgrims. I do yeah. have a pilgrim <laughs> image in there. I have to have that. But... But yeah, it's and, and so the whole Wrigley series is it's fun for kids, but also to give them a little bit of history. And so we'll be taking trips to Washington D.C. and Philadelphia, and just kind of revisiting some of the highlights that that uh, I think all children should know. And I think our books are really important when it comes to teaching children about an environment they're not familiar with. Obviously, with the coral reefs, there are a lot of children out there who who will never see one or haven't seen one in their life. And I had an experience. I wrote a book called The Rabbits of West Wind Road. It is not out yet. And that was from my own personal experience with wild rabbits. Because what I didn't know when I lived in an area that we had quite a bit of acreage and you have desert here in Las Vegas is that, first of all, they will eat anything green. So my neighbors had their roses and they had their grass they were trying to grow. And I noticed all this chicken wire around everything. And I asked (laughs) them, why is all this chicken wire around here? And when I moved into my house next door across the wash, I thought, you know what? Because we had a well, so I could water as much as I wanted. So I'm going to plant a yard. I'm going to have a garden. You know, I'm going to do all these things. What I didn't realize is the wild rabbits. So I thought, I wonder, because you watch Bugs Bunny, and Bugs Bunny eats carrots. Uh So I wonder if these wild rabbits, (laughs) which have never (laughs) seen a carrot in their entire (laughs) lifetime, if they would eat carrots. So I went and bought what's called a bag of horse carrots. You get them 40 pounds to the bag. I brought them home, and at the end of the yard, which was about half acre I had stopped, I lined the carrots up one evening to see what would happen. And do you know those rabbits came up there and started eating those carrots? Sure. Yes. Next thing you know, every evening they were lined up, 20, 30, they just kept growing, of wild rabbits <laughs> waiting for those you. carrots. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Within in a year, because I had a, my back, the porch was all along the entire back of the house. Within a year, they were lining up along the porch waiting Ooh. for those carrots. And my neighbors were so angry at me. <laughs> they go, why are you feeding those wild rabbits? They're going to eat our plants. And I go, well, we'll go buy carrots. They'll eat the carrots. <laughs> So they left everything else alone. They left everything alone. They didn't touch my garden. They never bothered the grass. Nothing. But they did the neighbors. But that's because the neighbors (laughs) weren't feeding them. Now, now wait. I'm a small child, so I need to know the rest of the story. What happened to the rabbits and the carrots? Well, I will tell you this, that it got to be, uh, seriously, the 
parents were bringing their kids by to feed the rabbits in the evening <laughs> and sometimes in the mornings as well. Um, so it was really fun. I eventually moved, so I don't know what happened oh to dear. the rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah, and that's the sad part. But, you know, it was really interesting how with our environment, we forget we're invading their environment. That's They're true. not invading our environment. Mm -hmm. So we need to find a way to cohabitate with them. And that's what I did. I just thought, Bugs Bunny, carrots, let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. it, it worked. And it worked. <laughs> yes, it did. So it's actually it did. a pretty funny story. <laughs> it's funny, but it's true. I swear to you, every word of it's true. And I, I actually wrote a scene in there where there's this mean old neighbor with a broom chasing the rabbits. Well, that was true. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been Mr. Wilson. <laughs> so anyway, but you know, it is fun to write about the environment. I will tell you this, we're running out of time. So I would like to say thank you to our guests. And we've had um, uh, Walt Smith here and his De Debbie sitting off to the side. Deb's sitting over there all by herself. You can't see her on camera. Uh, and then we had Lori. Petrowski. 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 I'll get, one of these days, I will get that right. Yes. Petrowski. Yes, Petrowski. It's not hard to get Smith wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Thank you so much, Walt, <laughs> for being on the show. Uh, and then here's one I have down now. Yeah, and yeah. our co-host for today's show is Joyce K. Gatchenberger. Yes, you got for it. For the longest time, I used to butcher that name. You got but anyway, Joyce K. Gatchenberger. So thank you, you thank know, all you. Three for being here. Thank you, Joyce, for co-hosting today. Thank and you. And for more information about your book, where can we get information, Walt, about your book? Uh, well, there's the, like I said, there's the website, um, and that's bullabuddies.com. Can you spell that out so everyone will understand how that works? B-U-L-A, buddies, B-U-D-D-I-E-S, dot club. Dot club, uh, club. <laughs> oh no! Or no. or dot com. E you just invented a new pick. <laughs> Either one will get you there. And just a little quick, um, bula is the um, the same word in Fiji that aloha is in oh, Hawaii. Oh, so it's the nice wor most uh, used word in Fiji. Okay, that's why they're the bula buddies. Okay, cool. and uh, it, they use it for everything: hello and goodbye, and if you sneeze and whatever. Okay, so. all right. <laughs> and Lori, where can we learn more about your books again? And I know the children's books aren't ready, but they will be in the future. They will be. Yes, they'll be available on Amazon and through my website, LoriPetrowski dot com. L O R I P I O T R O W S K I. All right, and Joyce. You can get my books at linesoflistening.com, and you can also read my blog at linesoflisteningblog.wordpress.com. All right. I'd also like to mention that Aspects of Writing is conducting a writing and publishing seminar February 23rd from 10 o'clock a.m. to 4 p.m., and you can go to the aspectsofwriting.com website to learn more about that. Just click on the events page. And I'd also like to let you know that you can hear the show every Saturday at 1 o'clock p.m. Pacific Daylight Time on amfm247.com. It is on 14 terrestrial stations. Just go to aspectsofwriting.com to learn more about those. We also rebroadcast this show at 9 o'clock p.m. on Sundays on Blog Talk Radio. That's at 9 o'clock p.m. Pacific Daylight Time on Blog Talk Radio. So just go to Aspects of Writing again, aspectsofwriting.com to learn more. We're on Roku TV and several other outlets. There you can find all the different links that you need to go to to see where the show's broadcast. So until next week, this is your host, James Kelly reminding you, if you can dream it, you can write it. Thank you, everyone, for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you. They came to our world seeking new resources. Both Earth and Mars were lush with plant life and mineral deposits. Unlike Mars, however, Earth was alive with a vast array of creatures, not unlike their past world, the one where they had evolved nearly two million years ago. It took them over 20,000 years to reach our solar system, and another 20,000 to return home and report their findings. To their dismay, all that remained of their civilization was decaying cities and wandering souls. It would take another 20,000 years to reach Earth with the intent of creating a new oasis. During their time in space, they lost the ability to breathe. Now they had a new mission, not only to settle Earth, but also to create a new life form to house their souls. By the time they had reached our world, only one man's seeds remained for creating a new life form on Earth. 
From the fruit of his loin, the new man was created. In time, it was hoped that one of the species from the various primates they artificially inseminated would evolve to look like them. Theirs was a waiting game. To enter the Earth's atmosphere for a prolonged period of time would cause them to age and die before the transformation from primate to new man was complete. They needed new man to populate the Earth with shells for their souls. But time is running out. Could they intervene and create a new life form from Earth's primates in time to save their souls and more importantly, are we at that stage in our history now? Perhaps they already walk among us. The answers lie with Daniel's story of abduction as leaked to the press, the alien transcripts.